Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who would stop the world and melt with you. Here is the captain. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring The Bible Salesman. This is an old ale by the shifty folks over at Transplants Brewing Company. This is a powerful old ale aged in bourbon barrels and it's 9% alcohol by volume. So please drink this one at home. Garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thank you to those who helped us fill up the fridge this week here in the garage. First up. A double-fisted cheers to Charlotte and Lottie in London, the UK Garage Granny. So a long-distance cheers to both Charlotte and Lottie. And last but not least, we have our boy Thomas listening in. What we have to say is parts unknown because he says he loves checking out True Crime Garage on YouTube while his boss thinks that he is busy working. So cheers to the working class and cheers to everyone that helped us with this week's beer run yeah b-w-e-w-r-u-n beer run yeah go over to youtube and subscribe and that's enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime When bad men commit acts of evil with impunity, it only inspires other bad men to do the same. So, how many bad men has the Hammer Man inspired? This week, we profile a killer who surely has inspired many urban legends, especially those terrifying urban legends about young women getting into cars with strange men. The hammer man did not care for his fellow man. He did not value human life, and he hated women. He saw women as something to be used up, destroyed, and discarded. He only valued his own life and his own freedom so that he could take away yours. He was a savage killer. Then he was the hitcher, and then he became the want ad killer. He was called so many things during his time of catching and killing. Many called him the devil. One member of law enforcement said, The guy is the devil. They should have fried him years ago. When he was dead, they should have driven a stake through his heart and buried him, digging him up a week later to ram another stake in, just to make sure he was dead. That was Chief Investigator Russell J. Kruger, Minneapolis PD. This is the true crime story of a career criminal, a real-life monster, an American nightmare. This is the story of the Hammer Man, and this is True Crime Garage. It was just a little over 50 years ago. It was May 2nd, 1973, a Wednesday evening in Seattle, Washington, when Mrs. Miller, a single mother of one, was starting to get worried. Mrs. Miller came home that Wednesday to an empty house. Her daughter, Catherine Sue Miller, must have still been out with some friends. It was unlike her to not be home when her mother arrived, But Kathy Sue was 15 years old. She was growing up, and she was just three weeks away from her 16th birthday. 
Mrs. Miller knew Kathy Sue not only had a gaggle of friends, but she had a boyfriend as well. This is a very innocent type of relationship, a very young relationship. The two were really more friends than traditional boyfriend and girlfriend. Heck, the two had not even really reached the stage of puppy love yet. Kathy must be out with her boyfriend, Mom thought. They were often together walking and talking in the neighborhood. Or perhaps she was with some of the neighborhood girls. But still, it was unusual But nothing to be concerned with. And being a single mother, one tends to stay busy. And busy can easily distract one's heart and mind. Mrs. Miller went about her evening, preparing things for tomorrow and getting dinner ready for her and Kathy. But that is when it set in. The worry. The not knowing. Maybe some mothers would be angry, thinking that the teenager had simply decided to not play by the household rules. Or was just outright defying her mother, but not Kathy. Kathy was a good kid who grew into a good teenager, and she was no trouble at all for the single mother. But still, it sets in. Mrs. Miller walked the dinner plates over to the table and sat them down. It was 7 p.m., and there was no sign nor word of her daughter. Mrs. Miller didn't take a bite. She didn't wait for the hot dinner to get cold. Instead, she turned from the table and walked over to the telephone, hanging on the kitchen wall. The little notepad on the small table next to where the phone on the wall was had several phone numbers for some of the other girls the same age as Kathy, listed in the notepad's pages. Mrs. Miller started calling those numbers. Most of the girls, or at least their parents, were easily reached, But unfortunately, none had seen Kathy after school that day. Unsure of what to do, Mrs. Miller sat down at the kitchen table and began to question herself. Should she call the police or should she just wait? Maybe Kathy had lost track of time and would be home any minute now. Then Mrs. Miller remembered an ongoing conversation between her and her daughter a conversation that the two did not see eye to eye on. And it was so rare that the two did not agree that now she was starting to think, of course, this is why she had not come home. And why had she not thought of this before? Well, their disagreement was a simple one. She saw a want ad in the paper for a job she wanted to apply for, and her mother didn't want her to apply for that job. That's right. Kathy Sue expressed to her mother just two days prior that she wanted to get a job. So it's May and the school year would be out for the summer very soon. And remember, Kathy is just three weeks from her 16th birthday. And some of her 16 year old friends were starting to work at jobs. This is mostly stuff near their homes. Very part time work. Kathy's boyfriend, too. He had a job, but he also wanted another job for the summertime. And the two had spent some time perusing the want ads together in the News Tribune. Kathy and her mother's disagreement was about a particular job opportunity. Kathy's mother thought that the arrangements for this job interview were not entirely kosher. Just a day prior, Kathy showed her mother a want ad for a gas station attendant job. Kathy had called the number listed and spoke with the owner of the gas station. He said that he needed to hire someone fast and he needed Kathy to come into the gas station as soon as possible, as soon as she could for an interview and to fill out any tax forms that would be required. Kathy said that her mother wouldn't have time to take her until the weekend. The owner suggested that she waited for him at an intersection. This would be not too far from her home and after school on that Wednesday and that he would come and pick her up so that she would have a ride. He's going to provide the ride to her back to the gas station where they can talk, they can do the interview, and she can fill out any of the necessary paperwork. But this is not a normal request. Not at all. And Kathy's mom was hip to that. She told, Kathy told her mother about the arrangement And she told Kathy, no, 
She did not think that it was professional and that she is not to be getting into cars with a man for which both of them had never met. Good advice. Kathy's mom then, remembering all of this, springs into action, jumps up from her chair at the kitchen table, and she went looking through the house. She's looking for the old newspapers. Yeah, the want ads. And finally, she located the section of the newspaper that her daughter had shown her previously. So she found the circled want ad for this gas station job that Kathy had shown to her. Mrs. Miller picked up the phone and... She dials the number listed for the gas station. Mrs. Miller called the phone number and a man answered. She asked for her daughter. She told the man that she was aware of an arrangement for her daughter to be picked up by someone. And she knew that the meeting was to be sometime after Kathy's school day. Mrs. Miller asked if the man had seen her daughter, Kathy, or perhaps even picked her up that day. This man, this business owner, tells the mother, well, I did talk to her, but I didn't pick her up. Yeah, he says, I remember talking to the girl, and he even says, I wrote her name down, and then pauses for a second and says, Catherine Miller, right? And she says, yes, that's my daughter's name. Have you seen her? And the man says that he agreed to pick her up near her home. He goes on to tell Mrs. Miller that he drove out there. However, once he got to the location, her daughter wasn't there. He doesn't know where she could be. He said he waited for a few minutes, but he was far too busy to be just waiting around for too long. And so after a short while, he drove off and he hadn't seen the girl at all. The phone call did not last much longer. Okay. Mrs. Miller is near full panic mode now. And after she hangs up the phone, Captain The next call is going to be to Kathy's boyfriend. And this is not going to make Mrs. Miller feel any better about her late and missing daughter. So she's sitting down to dinner, waiting for daughter to come home. She remembers this job interview. And now Mrs. Miller is on the phone with Kathy's 15, 16 year old boyfriend. And this is a kid from the neighborhood that Mrs. Miller has known for a long time, right? So she trusts this kid and she asks the boy, have you seen Kathy? She was hoping that the two were just hanging out somewhere, but keep in mind when the, when these two hung out, they were typically out in the neighborhood walking and talking together. Right. And so just the boy being home is not going to feel very good to Mrs. Miller. It's not a good sign. No, because her daughter, Kathy doesn't go and hang out at his house. So the boy does have some information. He tells Mrs. Miller and a little bit shamefully. So because he knew that Kathy was not to take this appointment. And he says, look, I went with your daughter to stand on the corner there and wait for the guy to pick her up. And he tells Mrs. Miller, he says, look, Kathy knew that she wasn't to take the meeting, but she really wanted the job for the summer And she thought that you wouldn't be mad if I went with her. However, this kid had a paper route. And remember, we've talked about this on the show plenty of times, but back in the day, they delivered papers in the morning and oftentimes in the evening as well. People love their news. You got to get that evening newspaper. So what's the boyfriend's story to Mrs. Miller? He says he went with Kathy to the corner. And she filled him in on all the details. This guy's going to pick me up. Remember, he tells Mrs. Miller that Kathy knew she wasn't to go, but if he went with her, maybe she wouldn't be upset with her. So he agrees to go with her. However, at some point, the man's not on time. The car doesn't show up. The vehicle doesn't show up. So he says to Kathy, look, you should go home. I have to go do my paper route. Unfortunately, man, he, he tells Mrs. Miller, that when I last saw Kathy, she was still standing on the corner waiting for the gas station owner to pick her up. And I went off and did my paper route. So he's just as surprised as Mrs. Miller when he gets this phone call that Kathy didn't go for this job interview or, or wasn't home at least by 7 p.m. Now we're in probably 7.30, 7.45 that night. 
This makes Mrs. Miller incredibly nervous. Remember, she didn't want her daughter to go meet this guy in the first place. And now her daughter's not home. And she's already spoke to the guy who says he's the gas station owner who says, yeah, I went to pick her up and she wasn't there. So Mrs. Miller, of course, calls the Seattle police department and reports her daughter as missing, tells the story the Seattle Police Department, they do take a report. Now, what they do with the report that evening is anyone's guess. It's a mystery. It's not well documented what took place. If they went out driving around looking for her or just put out an APB for her, uh, I would guess that those are probably some efforts that were taken that night. But what we do know is, keep in mind, this is the 70s, and where we might feel like that was not enough effort put onto this scenario, often in the 70s, man, they didn't even take a a report, a missing report for a teenager or a youngster until they had been gone for 24 hours. Some jurisdictions were even doing 48 hours. Right. Because you had so many kids that just weren't where they were supposed to be. They end up coming home after dark. They get yelled at by mom and dad that may be grounded for a couple of days and that's the end of it. And you've just wasted the police's time. But in this situation, at least they take the report. Now this is going to have quite the domino effect because these reports, while we don't know what was done with it that evening, they are handed off to the higher ups when they come in for the day shift the next morning. Right. The higher ups in this situation are detectives. So now we have to introduce to everyone detectives, Dwayne Holman and William Bowman, Holman and Bowman. The two of them read the report, follow up with a call to Mrs. Miller. They think that it sounds suspicious enough that they're going to go out and investigate. They don't think that this is a, a runaway situation. And if it is wonderful, the kid comes home and everything's fine. Well, either the businessman is lying and he's responsible or the possibilities then become endless because she's at the corner of a decently busy intersection. Exactly. So they go out to the gas station to talk to the man that was on the phone. And when they get there, they meet a person that is described as a large man. He's about six foot two, 200 pounds. And his name is Harvey Lewis Kerrigan. Now, Harvey is the gas station owner, and this gas station is very successful. So he has attendants and cashiers working for him. Most of them are of the teenage years, a lot of you know teen boys, teen girls. And he tells the officers, he says, look, I was really hoping to, to hire a boy, but When I got the call from the girl, I needed the help, so I told her I would take the interview. He tells the officers, Detective Holman and Bowman, the same story that he told Mrs. Miller the prior evening. We had an arrangement for me to pick her up so she could fill out the tax paperwork. It it sounds like she was getting the job just by calling. Like the, The interview was more of a formality and that they would be filling out paperwork so that she could start ASMP. And so he's telling them this story, but what the detectives are noticing right away, Captain, is that this dude does not seem to be responding very well to their presence. He starts sweating profusely. He looks incredibly nervous. He's a big man. It's a big man, and it's summertime. It's hot out there. It's hot in the hot tub. During some of the questioning, and they're not even getting very suspicious. with. They're not overly obvious with their suspicions. They're not really accusing him of anything at this point. They're simply asking him questions, and they say that not only does he appear to be sweating, nervous, but at some of the questions, he becomes angry and agitated when they're repeating their questions. Yeah, douche canoe. However, they see no reason to further question this man. There's no indication that Kathy ever was picked up by this guy. They don't have any witnesses saying that this guy picked her up. They have his story, the same story that he said the night before. They don't know that everything fully checks out, 
but they leave the interview still suspicious of this man, but with nothing really to go on to finding Kathy. That's, that's their main number one concern right now is where is this girl? So this business owner, Harvey, he's telling her mother, yes, I, I spoke with her. I just never picked her up. The cops go out to talk to him. He becomes a sweaty mess. And so when they go back to the station, look, he, 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 he gave law enforcement some red flags. So what are they going to do? They're going to look up his past criminal history. I think we need to give a little kudos here. Now, this seems like standard procedure today, but back then, 1973, not so much. This guy must have appeared to be nervous enough that it set off some red flags for the two detectives. And as you said, Captain, they get to the station, they do a background check on Harvey Kerrigan, and what they see in that background check will make their blood boil. We are back. Cheers to everybody. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to everybody out there tuning in once again this week. We are happy and lucky to have you. Now, Captain, we have to go back in time here because what we have is our two detectives. They just come from this meeting with the gas station owner, Harvey Kerrigan, that leaves them feeling a little unsettled. They have a missing girl. She's not even been missing for 24 hours yet. About 16 hours by this time. Last seen hanging out with one of her friends, waiting for a ride after school the previous day. Yeah, then they go talk to this guy that claims that he did talk to her on the phone and was going to pick her up, but she just wasn't there. And he's a little sweaty. He's a little sweaty. So now they have to figure out, okay, is this guy lying to us? Mm Mm-hmm. Because he looks nervous when we talk to him. Or or does he just have a heart condition? Or did he do as he say, went to go pick her up and she's not there. He doesn't know what happened to her. Now us, the detectives, got to figure out if somebody else picked her up. Right. So back at the station, they decide to run a background check on Harvey Kerrigan. Now, I want to point out here, this guy, he is kind of odd looking. We already referenced that he's a larger man. Oddly shaped feet. But he's also the type that he's easy to talk to, and he's a successful local businessman. His gas station in Seattle was a success. We should point out, too, don't don't get overly jealous here, people, but back then, regular gas, 35 cents a gallon. Wow. The Primo stuff, 39 cents a gallon. Oh, fancy pants. That's right. So he's pumping more gas. His gas station is selling more gas than the others in town. So he's a a successful small business owner. They don't feel, other than the nervousness and the sweating, that he has any reason to tell them anything other than the truth. But But, but he is. um, I would consider him to be fugly. You're not the only one. Yeah. So our friend Ann Rule, R.I.P., she described him, and I like when we have a, a, a respected lady describing a man rather than us two garage guys. I'll tell you the truth. I tell, you, I tell it like I see it. She referred to him as a huge man with hands like hams, mm. A brow that resembled that of a latter-day Cro-Magnum man, which I think looking at his picture, that description is pretty spot on. So they run a background check on Harvey Kerrigan, and what they find is a plethora of troubling items in this dude's history. Yeah, the one detective asked the other one, does it look like he has a plethora of criminal activity? 
he does and not not any like small time crime either so let's go back in time and we're going to go back to 1948 so this is just a little under 25 years before 15 year old Kathy Sue Miller goes missing 1948 Harvey Kerrigan is 21 years old He's in the army. Now I do want to point out here. There are some sources that say he was in the air force. Most say he was in the army. I could not figure out between the two, which one it was. My guess is neither branch of our military service wants to claim this guy. He's stationed at Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska. Now on July 31st, 1949, this is, This is after he's been there for some time, obviously. There's a woman, Laura Showalter, 57 years old. She's walking home. That's a Sunday night. She's walking home from the theater. She doesn't make it home that night. The next morning, that Monday morning, a woman's brutally beaten body was found. The cause of death was due to several blows to the head. Now, by that Monday afternoon, Captain... Police have a man, not under arrest, not charged with anything, but they have this man at the station and he is being questioned about his possible involvement in this woman's murder. The body was that of Laura Showalter. It took a few days to identify her, but not a few days to have a suspect. They very quickly land on a suspect. And why? How do they land on a suspect so quickly? Well, Law enforcement has an eyewitness. Yes, and this is a very odd story. I think so odd that the police have to believe the details of the story. So they find this woman, unfortunately, horrible situation, having been beaten to death, found in a public location. Right. So they canvass the area, and one of the persons who was walking home that night the previous night, the Sunday night, says to the police, yeah, that's weird that you found that body. This was like a park type setting. He says, I was walking home last night in the same spot where she is lying, where you found her body. I saw her lying with a, with a guy and they look like they were being romantic. They look like they were maybe on a date and it was getting a little hot and heavy. Right. And he goes, so I kind of looked away because I didn't want them to be embarrassed or think that I was peeping or anything like that, but it was on my way home. I saw the two of them. I thought they were making out. I continued on and went to bed. Didn't think anything of it. Now you find a woman in that same spot. Now he could not tell the detectives with 100% certainty that the woman they found is the woman that he saw because he said he saw more of the man than the woman. He's kind of filling in the blanks, right? Sometimes you see this stuff and you fill in the blanks a little bit, but the blanks that he was not filling in was the description that he gives of the man. And he says the man clearly was a younger soldier in his early twenties. Um, and he gave the description of this man. He says he was a larger white guy, probably about over six feet tall, around 200 pounds. He had the mutton chops, right? The very long sideburns. And that's about the best description that they can get, that he can provide. However, there's some really good clues in there. Over six feet tall is above the average height for a male back then. So that shrinks your suspect pool very quickly. There's shrinkage. On top of that, he's able to say this guy's a younger man. He's in his early 20s. Right. He's a soldier. I believe by the way that he was dressed, that he was probably a soldier. And then the mutton chops on top of that. So the we're pl- shrinking the, the pole pretty qu- quick. Very much. Yeah. There was significant shrinkage, as they say. <laughs> yeah, well, the water was cold. So they go around canvassing the area. And, of course, they're going to go to the base there, that Fort Richardson's. Right. And they want to start looking for a guy that would fit that description. They ask around, they find a guy. So they bring this guy in and he's very nervous, 
sweating a lot. Sweaty. He's answering their questions, but he appears to be incredibly nervous. Now, they do the old police lineup, and they bring back in the neighbor, and the guy says, yeah, that one right there, that's the guy that I believe that I saw with the woman in the park the night before. The guy's name is Harvey Kerrigan. Of course, he is a soldier, and they arrest him, but they don't have anything to really hold him on. There's no physical evidence. This is 1949. So keep in mind, the detectives are always behind the eight ball in these situations just based off of the lack of technology, therefore the lack of physical evidence. All they have is this guy saying, I'm pretty sure that that's the guy that I saw with that woman last night. Now, that sounds like a good case, but you take that to court and you get a good defense team and they're going to present to the jury, well, this this man can't even say that the woman that he saw was the murder victim. This man can't say with 100% certainty that the guy that he picked out of the police lineup is the guy that he saw that night in the under the cover of darkness. So while this man, Harvey Kerrigan, remains one of those guys that we talk about so much here in the garage, right, Captain? One of these guys where police go, you know what, we're pretty sure, we're 99.9% sure we know who did this. Right. We just don't have the evidence to lock this dude up. Now, we need to fast forward to September 16th, 1949, when we have an attempted rape and a horrible, a brutal attack on a woman named Dorcas Callan. So she's attacked, and there's an attempted rape assault on this young woman. Thankfully, she is able to escape the clutches of her attacker. She immediately goes to police. She tells the police that she was approached and attacked by a drunken soldier early that morning. It's like 11 a.m. and the soldier who approached her was drunk. And she describes this attack as he started to bring up some kind of conversation, try to have conversation with her that was friendly conversation. However, when she rejected his advances. Because he's wasted at 11 o'clock. He's wasted at 11 o'clock and she's probably got places to go. It's the middle of the day. And so she rejects his advances, and then he becomes violent. He just he tries to abduct her, tries to attack her, tries to rape her. And he physically assaults her. Now, she is able to provide a description to detectives of her assailant. And right away, ding, ding, light bulbs and bells are going off. That description is of the same guy that they talked to Back in July, July 31st, August 1st, about the woman found dead in the park, Laura Showalter. So they very quickly go out and pick up Harvey Kerrigan. And it's mostly because of two factors, right? One, the attack was so similar to the attack and murder for which Harvey was questioned that took place less than 70, 70 days prior and the description gave to police in this latest attack where Miss Callan survived after having escaped both she and then another independent witness described the man and his clothing and this too matching the suspect in the July murder case. So Harvey Kerrigan is picked up and he's questioned, identified in a police lineup by both the surviving victim and the witness from the previous crime And now this other independent witness. So now you have three people saying, look, that's the guy I think that was with the murder victim in the park. One person saying I was attacked by this man. And the other one saying I witnessed him talking to her before the attack. Right. So they're going to arrest this soldier Harvey and they're going to charge him with murder, rape and assault. Yes, murder, rape, attempted rape, and assault. And at this time, Harvey Kerrigan is 22 years old, and he is in the Army. Now, we get to December of 1949, Anchorage, Alaska. Harvey Kerrigan is found guilty 
in what the papers were calling a rape slaying of 57-year-old Laura Showalter. After the trial, Harvey is sentenced to death. And in fact, they announce during sentencing and at the, the end of the trial, the hanging of Harvey L. Kerrigan, age 22, will be held adjacent to the federal jail on March 3rd between 6 and 8 a.m., 1950. So that's very quick from guilty to sentencing to death for back then. We don't experience that today. And I don't know if this announcement was meant for this to be a public hanging or what, but it, it sounds a little bit like that. You know, we're, we've sentenced this man to death and Oh, by the way, mark your calendars. It's going to be March 3rd between six and 8 AM. And here's the location. So if we jump in the DeLorean and go back to the future, this is what the detectives are seeing when we have a missing 15 year old and this guy is saying, Hey, I, I, yeah, I was supposed to pick her up, but she never showed up. And this, so the detectives have evidence that this guy is capable of anything and everything evil. But if this sentence was carried out, then Harvey Kerrigan would be like B. Real says, a dead man walking. Yeah. So what happened? There's much more to this story. So after the trial, as we said, he's sentenced to death. Now we get the guilty verdict, but before sentencing, Harvey's defense counsel requests a new trial. The judge denies this and sentences Harvey to hang. The defense counsel cited 11 grounds for asking for a new trial, including an unfair and impartial jury saying that the court should have granted a change of venue. And because the case was well known and it was publicized at the time that there was no way that you could have an impartial jury without a change of venue and that Harvey was convicted mostly on him having confessed to authorities And this part of the story is rather complicated, but I'll do my darndest here, Captain, to explain it. The defense cites that the confession, they end up charging him with the, with the murder and with this other attack based off of him confessing. They don't have a lot of physical evidence. They have these eyewitnesses who pick him out of a lineup, but the whole conviction and the whole sentence to death is based around his confession. He was brought in by the U.S. Marshals, interviewed time and time again. They brought in like a psychologist and doctors and surround him by all these people and convince him to tell them what actually happened. How do they convince him to to tell what actually happened when he denied any wrongdoing or any involvement at all initially? Well, the defense cites that the confession was only obtained due to a, quote, secret interrogation and promises made by persons at the interrogation to the defendant and also due to psychological pressures placed upon placed upon the charged individual, Harvey Kerrigan. So what happens here, Captain, is that they're stating that he was promised, Harvey Kerrigan was promised, if look, if you confess, we can't sentence you to death. We can lock you up for life or put you away for a long time. You just need to tell us what happened. Get this off your conscience. We, we won't be able to kill you if you confess. Well, he confesses, they take him to court, and then they sentence him to die. So what ultimately ends up happening here is that Harvey and his defense counsel, they won a new trial on this murder conviction. And this new trial takes place in 1951 on the grounds that his confession had been improperly obtained an officer interrogating Kerrigan. As we said, told him he could not, would not be executed if he confessed to the murder. So, So he gets this new trial and at this trial, Harvey's confession, the one that was used at the previous trial to secure a conviction And what would have been, would have sealed Harvey's fate with his death was suppressed. And without the confession, they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute. So the murder charge essentially is dismissed. 
thus ultimately freeing Harvey of an early demise. Right. At least one other source states that the Supreme Court overruled Kerrigan's death sentence due to the officer's violations of the McNabb rule. But he still had the rape and assault charges from the September attack for which he was convicted. And so he had to continue to serve out his sentence minus the death penalty. So he. So do we know how long he ended up serving? Well, he was sentenced to 15 years but for assaulting Miss Callan. But of course he doesn't serve the whole time, does he? You and I have been doing this show long enough, and our listeners have been listening loyally long enough to know that most cases. That's a shame. We're. Most cases, at least here in Ohio, you are hoping that the prisoner serves out 80% of the sentence. Now, keep in mind, we've we've gone through time and time again the problems with the overpopulation, overcrowding of prisons in different states throughout the different decades of the 20th century and how it led to the early release of a lot of those inmates. Well, he's sentenced to 15 years. In 1952, he's transferred to Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. And then Harvey is paroled in 1960. So he served eight more years after he is transferred to Alcatraz. So old uh, sweaty Harvey serves about nine years of that sentence. Nine years, and meanwhile, the police know that he's a murderer. So once he's paroled, Harvey moves to Minnesota. This is closer to where he is from. He he was born in North Dakota. Well, I hope this comes out right, but we see sometimes with criminals that they kind of outgrow this type of behavior. They can age out of violence, but that's not what we're going to see with this man. And then on top of that, keep in mind how young he is right. at this time. So he's in his, he's 33. When he's paroled, he goes to Minnesota. And on August 5th, 1960, Harvey Kerrigan is arrested in Minnesota for burglary, assault, and attempted rape. He's convicted on those charges and sentenced to, hold your breath, don't get too excited, two and a half years in a Minnesota state prison. Wow. And then he gets, fortunately, he gets another 2,086 days. I didn't know that they sentenced you in days in some jurisdictions, but he gets another 2,086 days in federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. From there, he is released on parole, and he picks up once again and moves to Seattle, Washington, where just eight short months later, Harvey Kerrigan is arrested for second-degree burglary and sentenced to 15 years in the Washington State Prison at Walla Walla. During this prison stint, Harvey uses the resources provided there within to obtain a high school GED diploma, and he takes some college courses. Of note, he takes some criminal psychology courses. Doesn't seem like a good idea to offer those. He is paroled four years after he gets there. This takes us through 1968, Captain. We still got five more years until detectives are talking to him about a missing little girl, 15-year-old Kathy Sue Miller, where we first started off today's episode. Well, Harvey is going to be paroled, and after he is paroled, he meets a lady. Her name is Sheila Moran. Yeah. And they strike up a relationship. He eventually moves in with Sheila and Sheila's daughter, and the two marry. Proving that there's somebody for everybody. Yeah, and I'm guessing, I'm hoping, and praying that Sheila was unaware of Kerrigan's previous history. Right. Because nothing infuriates me more than when I see a woman with a child allow somebody with a lengthy, violent, sexual violence to criminal history into their home. Yeah, because you're not just putting yourself at risk. You're putting your children at risk as well. Exactly. You you might as well just march that child right to the front line of danger. Mm-hmm. So the two meet. They strike a, strike it up. They, they hit it off. They get married. 
Now he's living with mom and daughter. But during this time in 1969, he's 42 at this at this point in our timeline. He's arrested for a parole violation and sentenced to serve another year at Walla Walla. Now, during this time, Sheila divorces Harvey Kerrigan. And she states that she is seeking the divorce due to physical abuse suffered by the hands at the hands of Harvey. The divorce goes through. He serves his year. He gets out. He must be one charming fellow because to look at this guy, you go, how would this dude get a date? And then, then icing on the cake, his criminal history. But once he gets out, he meets another woman, Alice Johnson. Very fugly. Marries her moving in with her and her two children. Right. We have little Billy, who's 11 years old at the time, and Georgia, her daughter Georgia, who's 14. One thing we need to point out here, Captain, is this brings us to the latter part of 1972 in our timeline. And one thing that is key here, and we'll come back around full circle eventually, is that Harvey Kerrigan, he receives a handful of speeding tickets during this time period. In October of 1972, a young woman, 20-year-old Laura Leslie Brock of Bellingham, Washington, goes missing. And she's found rather quickly. Unfortunately, she's found dead. Her cause of death is due to several blows to the head. And then this will lead us into 1973 when Kathy Sue Miller goes missing, age 15, goes missing early May of 1973. This is the disappearance that the police just left the gas station talking to the owner of the gas station where she was going to apply for a job, had an appointment arranged with the owner, Harvey Kerrigan. Detectives talk to this man. They get back to the station. They run a background check on him. That's the information in story form that they find on the guy that they just talked to about a missing 15-year-old girl. Big thank you to everybody that's been sharing our little garage show on social media. It helps keep the lights on. Join us back here in the garage, same bat time, same bat channel. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't live.